from the class I went to. <laughs> this call is now being recorded. I'm just coming from a class, a face-to-face -face class, and um, maybe the go they know that, but I'm dressed warmly. So today we are looking at photography, digital photography activities for children in rural primary school. Uh, this is as per CBC. We would have gone beyond, but CBC requires us to focus on lower primary from grade one to six. So this particular course is up to grade three. Then another course will focus from grade three to grade six. Um, photography is very interesting to both the young children, to you people that are here, the millennials, to the old like me, and also to the elderly that are older than me. Everyone wants to take an image to keep us a memory or to instantly share with their friends through the many digital technologies that are in existence. We have a variety of technologies. It might be Corona. I'm worried though. <laughs> I did not get that job. <laughs> I was a friend of becoming an horse. <laughs> anyway, so I'm observing my husband because he took it to see how it turns out in 10 years. Then I'll take mine if I'll be there. <laughs> of course, I'll be. So, digital technologies are in existence, and we have a variety of them that you can take images and spread to other people. We have technologies, uh, <clears throat> we have two technologies. Web3 technologies, Web4 technologies, and currently we are on Web5 technologies. So from Web2 technologies to Web5 technologies, we have a whole lot of applications that are there that we can share our images on. And some of these technologies, the ones available in Kenya because in Kenya we've not developed as much. so. Most of the people are in Web 2.0, Web 3.0. Very few are on Web 4, and also few are on Web 5. So now, most of the courses, most of the applications that are available for us in our case here in Kenya, which are also recognized worldwide, we have technologies like WhatsApp, we have technologies like Instagram, we have technologies like TikTok. We have technology like Facebook, YouTube, Likey, among others. What have I left out that you can add? Those that are already seated in this class, what have I left out you can add as an app that you use? Sharon, Sandra, Karanja. Check it. <clears throat> what prong, what app have I left out? Okay, those ones have no idea. <laughs> so it's still okay. So photography allows us to build visual stories with the help of images to be able to tell these stories and there is need to teach children how to take and make good photographs that are able to tell the story without ones and the story we want to communicate, okay? So to start, up, to start us off, we will look at, um, experimenting there is no one waiting to join to punya because i can see there is no one even on your screen you're not seeing anyone there is no one on my list waiting to join so <clears throat> when they come i will admit them as they come who is saying they are waiting because there is no one are you seeing anyone on your screen
There is no one waiting. Are you seeing? Who is Winnie ako happy? Hakuna Winnie mwambie aingie. She has not requested to be admitted. So anaongea akiwa nje na hiyo ni mchezo. Mwambie aingie when she comes she will be admitted. Okay, let's continue. Uh, Winnie is not here. Akiingia hata wewe utasikia there is someone. When they come there is always a beep. You know when she comes. I'm not seeing her. So there is no one on my screen pending, pending to be to be admitted. So akikuja tu nitampata. Sawa, sawa. Akiingia hata wewe utasikia tu there is a beep telling you there is someone. Now I want us to focus on um experimenting and having fun taking photographs with digital technologies experimenting and having fun taking photographs with digital technologies um <clears throat> like i said it's fun for all of us from the very young to the very very old and to start us off I will take you to some videos that I want you to watch. I'll, I'll take you first to a link, link one, link two, and link three, to be able to follow through and see whether we are where we want to be. And so that you can also have an idea and a clue on what I want you to do. So I'll share my screen and take you to that video right now. So then again, you watch and learn as you make fun of it. So present my screen, start presenting. <clears throat> if my voice is not so good today, like I've seen, uh, I'm from a face-to-face -face class and I came back with a cold immediately. So you know whether I'm an that's that money mini but uh i shall be well so now i'm presenting all right and this is what i want to present i want to confirm that my voice is good then i want to take you to the youtube video ah this video cannot print this can't be printed in the background okay why Let's see if it plays. Okay, that is it. I hope you can be able to see the screen I want to present. Let me try again going through it. Fun photography projects for you and your kids to do isn't as hard as you expect. This is why we've designed three really fun photography projects you can try with your kids. So let's jump into it straight away. So, mini photo projects, by their definition, are really easy to do. Therefore, it's great to involve your children or even your grandchildren. Now, we've designed three of them based off the back of our Life Photography Home Projects course. They are really simple to do, very little setup needed, very little expense needed, and we don't have to crack out a nice fancy DSLR camera to try them with this. Because they are so simple and straightforward, you can even just do this with your iPhone or your other smartphone. So let's have a look at them in a little bit more detail. So project one we call shadow play. Now this is something you may have done when you were a child. If you wanted to kind of cast shadows onto the wall and make little hand bits from them, this is a really fun photography project to do. So all you're gonna so shadow play is one fun activity. <laughs> to know what shadow is all about. Concentrate. Need is a hard light, so that could be sunshine in your outdoors, or you just otherwise use a torch. So all you need to do is turn off all lights in your room and just use that one hard light. So if it's a bit of daylight that's coming through a window, just close the curtains, 
just get a very, very narrow uh, ray of light. Obviously, if it's a torch, that's be fine. Now, the best thing to do with your camera is actually focus on the wall. You want to focus on the shadows. Don't focus on the hands. You're not trying to actually get your hands into the photograph itself. It's just the shadows that are being cast. Try making uh, maybe a dog or a butterfly or some bird shapes to begin with. If you want to be a, a little bit more adventurous, then you can crack out some little props. Maybe you raid your kid's toy box or ask them to choose one of their favourite characters or figurines. You need to keep the toy, if you're only using one, and the wall fairly close together to get the strongest shadow. So it can be a little bit tricky if you want to make sure obviously you're actually avoiding capturing the action figure in the photograph. So if your kid's kind of uh, doing all the camera work, make sure you kind of set the, the best angle and the best uh, camera settings up beforehand. So all you need to do is press the shutter when you're ready. So project two we call Fun Food. Now this works on two different levels. One is a really creative and simple project to try out with your kids or grandkids. And on the second level, it's actually quite good for any fussy eaters. So if you know a little bit a little particular about fruit or vegetables, this is kind of a quite clever way to maybe encourage them to try something new. So firstly, all you need to do is raid your kitchen cupboards. So you're looking for vegetables, maybe raw pasta, fruit, something similar to that. And then what you need to do from there is set yourself up a kind of a blank table or just like a white board, something nice and clean and simple. And we're going to basically lay all these objects on, all these fruits and these vegetables on, to create a bit of a scene. So you can kind of maybe use things like kind of asparagus or celery, it's like, like grass if it was outside. You can maybe use like lemons or slices of lemons and oranges, it's like the sun. So it's just being a little bit interpretive and kind of creating a bit of a conceptual scene with all this food. But the idea of being able to kind of play around with it may just encourage, like we said before, any kind of fussy eaters to be a little bit more interested in foods that they've not seen before. So project three we call Splash Time. Now this one has got a little bit more uh, detail in terms of setting up, but not that much more really. We're not changing the rules of these projects. Now Splash Time, all you want to do is get yourself an empty vessel, a glass vessel, something similar to a fish tank. Obviously it'd be ideal if it's already empty, please don't throw your fish into the sink just for this photo project. By the way, all you need to do is empty the tank completely. Clean all the insides, inside and out, so any finger marks and things like that are completely taken away as best as possible. Now, once you've emptied it, you need to kind of fill it back up. So for fresh, cold water is going to be best. So set that tank with the water onto a table and you can set yourself a nice clean background behind it. Preferably a black background would work best. It's just going to give us the best contrast possible. Now, in terms of what we're actually going to splash, that's kind of up to you, but I think fruit tends to work a bit better. So you can use either whole parts of lemons, and oranges, or just segments and just slice them up a little bit. So in terms of camera settings, you are going to need maybe a couple of specifics. So I'm sure, again, depending on certain apps on a smartphone, you should be able to find the options to change shutter speed. So if you have got that ability to change the shutter speed, using a sports mode or a shutter speed of anything like a thousandth of a second or over uh, would be ideal because it's going to give us those kind of crisp edges of the shots just as they're flowing into the water itself. But if you've enjoyed this video, fingers crossed you have, and you've enjoyed the little projects we've talked about, there is going to be so many more projects like this in our My Photography at Home Projects course. So if you want to find out a little bit more about it, hit the link in the description and you can join up straight away. We've got over 50 projects very similar to what we've talked about today, all in a video-based course. It's only about seven, eight hours long the whole course itself, so you can probably do this entire course over a weekend or over a school holiday with it. kids is absolutely brilliant it's a completely different way that we're true approaching with videos now so hopefully you've enjoyed it if you did hit the subscribe button hit the notifications you can catch us on all the social medias drop us a comment we'd love to hear from you until the next time we'll see you soon okay like i've seen on the chat he has given you three fun activities that you can do with children one was with the food the other one was Splash time. So those are three activities he has given you. I want to take you to the second video. You see how fun it is if you are doing it with children, especially he has even told you if you have a child that's fusy and that does not want to eat what you can do. And that's fun to know. More ideas to your classwork when the time comes. This is video two.
these are examples of uh, photographs that have been taken by Deb Evans. Uh, your examples will be next for now. Watch has or his, sorry. <laughs> I hope you're seeing how the, the images are clear, how the center of focus comes out. You don't take a necessary background, you take uh, your target and you focus on your target. I hope you're seeing that coming out. If it was a Kenyan taking this, you will take all the way the ceiling, eh? the tables, the chairs, everything, almost the whole house will be captured in one image. So when you take a larger image, you take the focus out of whatever you want to take. So here you focus on the thing you want focus to go to. Just the image, not the background. Okay, those are some of the images that have been taken. And I still want to take you to another video. The last video here. <clears throat> there you go. It's also on experimenting and having fun. So in order to understand photography, I think it's really important to take a look at the history because I think it's a, it's really interesting and it also gives you some perspective. Yes, the history is very important. The history of photography. Yeah? The days before you were, how did things happen? Yeah? You were born in colored times. There was a time it was black and white and so on and so forth. So this history will help you to understand photography so that even as you are having fun with it, you will have fun with knowledge and facts at your fingertips. You can still ask those others to join class, uh, including the Winnie that says she's waiting. They can come. We will admit them when they join. So let's watch the history of photography. Yeah? Perspective on why photography developed the way that it did. Now, doing the research for this lesson, I realized it actually went back a little further than I had remembered. The first idea for a pinhole camera was kind of came up came up with in the time of Plato. So, in ancient Greece and in China, around the same time, people were kind of imagining doing sort of sort of thought experiments. So now, I hope you've had the pin cameras. The pinhole cameras, eh? Ile lazima uweke jicho kwa kashimo, uchungulie, ndiyo upike picha yako. Those pinhole cameras, they started in Greece and China. Umesikia mm, hapo? Okay. And the, the first cameras were the pinhole cameras. Eh? That's information that you need to <laughs> grasp. For something that would someday resemble what we would use hundreds of years later, thousands, later in the pinhole camera. Now the next step is the camera obscura. And the camera obscura is actually really interesting because it's basically a camera without film. The idea is you've got a wall, so you've got this empty room, and if you put a little tiny hole in the wall, the light will come in from the other side and it will be sort of focused through that hole and then onto the wall on the opposite side. So you can see here that this scene is being reflected on this wall or sort of focused on this wall through this hole. And 
this is basically the foundation of photography right here. This is the moment when this came into focus, or, well, really, quite literally as well. The only thing that was really missing was the chemicals for this. And these were discovered somewhere between the 1200, year 1200 and 1600. The different scientists at different times realized that, realized that there was this sort of group of chemicals that were related to silver, and one was silver nitrate. And this turned out, in the end, to be uh, photosensitive. And this whole discovery of it being photosensitive was first sort of formulated and organized by a guy named Wilhelm Homburg in 18, or, sorry, in 1694. That is when he realized that there was a, as he put it, a photochemical effect. Now the groundwork was basically laid for photography to begin. So from here, from 17, 1700 through the 1800s, um, you see kind of a focus on lenses and on sort of bettering this camera obscura over here. So you'd have people putting in a lens right here instead of just a hole. And this would lead directly to the developments that would come in the 1800s. And that development came roaring around the corner in 1826 in southern France. This guy right here. His name is Joseph. And his last name is Nips. Oh, and I'm spelling it wrong. And Joseph Nips was just kind of a guy who was interested in the entire idea of photography. And he wanted to develop some kind of camera. And he had taken a camera obscura and he had worked around with these light sensitive silver nitrates. And at the same time, he had been exchanging letters with this guy over here, Louis Degas. Well, Charles, uh, Joseph Neves was the first person to really come up with a photo, a permanent photo. And that's a really important distinction because a lot of people had made photos, but it was this was the first permanent, and I'm not spelling it right, permanent photograph. Lots of times they would make them and then they would soon deteriorate really quickly. But this was the first one that would last and it lasted up until now. You can see here that you've got some buildings, got maybe a field back here. And if you look really closely, you can actually see that the sun moves so far during the day that it's actually exposed the walls on both sides. So the lighting of the photo is actually a little off. Now this was done. You can see how <laughs> the images that were there in those, those days. They were the in thing, eh? Yeah, so so I'm gonna get my filters. See, you in in and in those days, what you're seeing there by Joseph <laughs> was the in thing, it was the real, real deal of those days. Eh? A piece of pewter with some just with some silver nitrate slapped on it, and it took eight hours to make this photograph so eight can you just imagine taking a photo that takes eight hours to make you eight hours not a joke instantly that one would take eight good hours to process and move the camera a single bit just have to leave the camera there for eight hours so this step now behind them the move then became to simplify and and strengthen the power of photography and to make the photograph something that you could take instantaneously, things that so it wouldn't take eight hours to make a photograph. So when Nips died, so Nips died, Nipsu, I'll say, died in 1833. And he passes all of his papers on to De Guerre, who in turn, just six years later, comes out with the daguerreotype, and this was a revolution. This was this was very, very big news because the daguerreotype took the same process and basically made it something that could be done more quickly and more permanently. So instead of taking eight hours, it would just take a few minutes to make a photograph. This is one of the first daguerreotypes. It's of a city, obviously, somewhere in southern France. And you can see here this guy with his foot up on a sort of pedestal. And this guy's actually getting his shoes shined. And there are lots of other people walking around on these streets, but this guy was the only person to stay still for the whole photograph, the whole time it was being made. 
And so he's the only, he's the first photographed human in well that we know of at least. So very interesting, you know. Um, so this whole discovery and the release of this discovery really prompted a lot of activity. Now this guy over here, his name is Fox Talbot. Fox Talbot was a British guy, so across the channel, and he had been interested in the idea of photography, or that wasn't called photography yet, but and the idea of capturing images on on silver nitrate plates, as they would say back then. And um, he and this astronomer, whose name was George, uh, sorry, John Herschel, uh, worked together on lots of different things. And in 18, <laughs> sort of through their collaboration, John Herschel came out with the glass negative. The glass negative was important because it was a better way of capturing the image and it was something that would become sort of a standard for some time for almost really 60 years or something like that so the glass negative is developed get the name down john herschel quite a famous astronomer in his own right as well as a developer of photography and then just one year later talbot comes out with his own process and it was called the calotype it was a wet process that had some sort of paper negative and the thing was though that talbot then this was talbot we'll make sure we distinguish that and the thing was that talbot put a copyright on this and that is the reason that really the daguerreotype took off because the daguerreotype was bought by the french government and put immediately in the public domain that meant that any photographer could use it and so the daguerreotype basically within a couple of months became the standard photography form of photography for, at that time and the calotype because it would have been a little bit more expensive and money would have been going to hair to, to fox talbot over here it never became quite the hit that the daguerreotype did now things went very quickly from here and within a couple months of the daguerreotype being developed it was already being used in the field and by the 1850s, it was really common to see roving photographers like this traveling through the countryside of, of Europe and, and even in America and other places and um, doing these sort of mobile photo studios. And because the whole, I mean, these days you can do everything they could do in this with a laptop and a camera and even a cell phone. But at the time, it took quite a lot. You had a lot of chemicals, you had to do a lot of mixing, you needed a dark room. So everything had to be brought with you in the wagon. But it was very quick. You could see here that prominent people, this is the, the czar and his wife, and this is, um, this is Abe, Abe Lincoln, one of the early American presidents, all being photographed early on because they realized the power and, and were all very fascinated by the idea of photography. Now, during the 1860s, um, the American Civil War was photographed by this guy named Bradley, or, well, it was most likely photographed mostly by his assistants, and he sort of took credit for it. Um, and this was basically, this was kind of more of the second incidence. The Armenian War was really the first incident of photography being used in war and photographing war. So, kind of an interesting note in history. Now, early studios would have looked something like this. So pretty much any time from the 1840s onward, you would have had a big, huge camera. You can see that is a massive camera. And you've got this guy sitting here doing this very sort of stilted pose. And the reason for this is because you've got this piece here holding his head. And this was sort of a required piece of equipment for um, for photographers at the time because the speed of the camera was still so slow. Um, you would have had to hold that pose for between two minutes and maybe if your photographer had a really fast camera, maybe 30 seconds. So that's a really long time. I want to go share for our two hours. Focusing to take your image. Hold your head very still for a photograph. So it's pretty amazing. You'll sometimes look in the photos and you'll see that people blinked during the photos or things like that. Um, but these machine, this piece of machinery here on the back, this sort of stand, is meant to secure the head. And it's often hiding behind the person in the photo. You don't usually see it when you look at the actual photos. But this is how people adapted to the technology as it progressed. So things got better and they didn't have to use that anymore.
now here is really where that step takes place where things really got a lot faster and really changed a lot 1870s um the dry plate comes out and it becomes really popular and instead of having wet plates of, of of copper or things like that that you had to put inside of a camera or um like a pewter plate or something like that you would just have a dry piece of emulsion that was sort of like the film that you would be used to from from but but on usually on like a hard plate not on something that was soft now in the 1880s kodak really made some big steps in the technology and really kind of came out with some things that would really forever change photography um in 1840 or in 1884 george eastman develops a dry gel on paper and so basically sort of the predecessor to the film that we would be using 50 years later uh in 1888 they came up with this slogan right here which i think is just great you press the button and we do the rest and they used to send cameras to their customers with a hundred photos in them and then the person could run around and take photos all they want to their heart's content and then send them into the kodak factory which looked something like this get it developed and they would then come back as photos and you can actually see here part of my family this is actually this right here is my great 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 grandpa they would make fit photos of each other and so there's all these great old photos from this time that were all probably most likely taken on kodak cameras 1924 was important because Leica came out with the first 35 millimeter camera. And 35 millimeter camera really revolutionized photography in some pretty fundamental ways. And the reason is because before this, cameras were just so big and heavy, it was really hard to take them out and capture things um, in in the way that you would experience. So you can see here, for example, this image from D-Day in World War II. This is sort of the style of photography that the 35 millimeter allowed for. People could bring a camera with them and shoot something running, running along with the action. And the camera was so light and small that you didn't have to even have a tripod. And it was fast enough that you could, you could really take a lot of new, innovative photos. Uh, after World War II, things really changed a lot. And this is where things really kind of blasted out of the gate. Um, the first SLR came in 1949, so this is a single lens reflex, and we'll explain what that means later, but this is a very special kind of camera that really kind of has become the industry standard for, for professional photographers. Also, um, the first digital image. So this is actually a scanned image, so it's not from a digital camera, but it is um, first di digital image right there. So from that moment on, photography really made a lot of leaps and bounds very quickly. In 1963, you get the Polaroid camera. In 1985, you got autofocus, which really changed the way cameras worked with, with consumers and really changed the kinds of cameras that consumers were buying. From there, you then moved into the 90s, and it was definitely the beginning of the digital age. You can see this NASA experiment up here. This was a press camera that was being experimented with. You can see it's like carrying a massive computer around. And then there were some early attempts at consumer cameras as well. And that brings us to now. That brings us to the almost now. In 2004, Kodak stopped making uh, film cameras, so they started switching over to digital cameras like this one right here. Cameras got to be a lot bigger, a lot, took a lot of different directions. You can see here um, the mirrorless uh, sort of wave of cameras that came in 2011. And uh, the DSLRs also got very big, very expensive, and started making video. So that is sort of the story of photography. You can check out more videos for this course and check out other courses at Oliver. So that is very interesting um, information that you've learned right there. This is very good history because it grounds you on things that uh, you need grounding on. And that is fun, actually, to understand. that um, we have come a wrong way. So even as we talk about experimenting, huh? you know you're experimenting from what point to what point? Because a lot has happened along the way. 
So now that is the history of uh, photography. And I want people to highlight some of the things that they have learned. The first camera was, uh, what camera to Punya? Sandra, Mati, if you are watching. Sharon? A pinhole camera. Yes, a pinhole camera was the very first camera. And who is the proponent of photography? The person that invented John Nippers. Aranja Grace. <laughs> yes. Kwenu mepea na anso kifanya lecturer disappear. Then to catch up a key to one, two, three. One, two, two, four. Asi to kalisha di five. Sorry about that. Network issues. Um, I think it's telling me to end the class. So we were looking at the types of cameras. So from the Pino camera to the camera obscura from camera obscura to silver nitrate, photosensitive cameras, then to photochemical effect cameras. 
After that, we went to Daguero type. After Daguero type, we went to Fox Talbot and the very first glass negative camera. I think that is where the network went off. Then after the glass negative, we went to Caro type Talbot. Then we went to Mobile Studios. From mobile studios, we went to fixed studios. I'm not on the ball or something. Someone was unmuting to speak. That is Wangeshi. Wangeshi, how may I help you? I'm sorry. You okay. So then from the mobile photo studios, we go to conduct cameras. You know now? Kondak is a big name even today. When you go buying any cameras, we have Kondak, we have what other types of cameras that now you see? Uh, Karanja. Nikon. Uh -huh, Nikon. And actually Nikon came way later after Kondak. So Kondak was the first, then we have Nikon. Um, already? Cameras that you know of? Zawakati Zainzi Zenu Sasa. You can go to any supermarket, you'll see all the brands right there. Uh, then after contact cameras and the dry plate, we went to, we advanced to dry gel paper. Then after that, we went to SLR cameras. Yeah. And the SLR cameras, is actually what gave birth to digital images. And we can also say it's the mother now of digital photography, right? And then after the digital images started, we went to the press cameras. Eh, ile unafinya a particular button. I've had several of these ones, the digital cameras, where you take images and save them. And now after the press cameras, we went to fully digital cameras. Like now what you have, your, your phone cameras, your computer cameras, now cameras became digital, digital. And with all the many cameras that are there, imaging and photography has become fun, easy. And we've... We are experimenting with it every other day. In fact, we need to be thankful to the proponent of photography, and his name was Joseph Nees. His work was carried forward by John Hessel. And now from the work of Joseph and John, those two Js, have made your life easy. Now you can take selfies everywhere because they are work. It's what we're enjoying today. They are long dead, but the fruit of their work, we are enjoying it. Yeah? Now, you cannot forget actually the first ever processed photo. Took how many hours? Mwangangi. Mwangi wangeshi. It took how many hours? Ama kuna wengine kwa cars, we have karanja. It took how many hours to process the very first photograph in the world? Eight. Eight hours. Yes. yes. Oh, eight hours. Straight eight hours. Eh? Just working on the photo. And this photo, you are dealing with chemicals. Chemicals, chemicals, chemicals. And the very first human being to be taken an image was doing what? To be captured on an image. Actually, it's not even known who the person was, but the very first human being to ever <laughs> be captured on an on a, on a image. The story is funny. He was seated still doing what? 
He was in a photo, he, he was in a, sorry, he was in a shoe shining kiosk. His shoes were being shined. So that was the very first man to appear on camera. And then after that, uh, other people to have appeared was the first president of America and other royal people. Eh? People could afford it those particular days. Now everybody affords. It's a necessity. <laughs> so now we can take selfies and send them anyhow. So now even as you go back to the second video where images were shared left, right and center, uh, on by people that took the images focusing on children, focusing on plants, focusing on flowers, focusing on cars, focusing on anything that you'd want to focus on. Uh, we need not to the work of Joseph Neef, which actually was advanced by John Hessel. And now today you are the next photographer yeah you're taking them and editing them and eh, someone else has handed you you count them filters and other things that you can work on i don't know even how to work on those things but i see my children doing all sorts of things with um, digital photography and we thank god for the fact that we've come so you've learned a lot of things today when you're taking image, so this is what you've learned from the third video. From the second video, you learned the idea is focus because you saw the focus, the, the images you saw were clear, uh, they were specific because you want them to tell the story even when you're not there. And that is why you enjoyed going through them. And the very first video took us through the having fun with photography and the gentleman spoke of doing fun play as you take the images like you can do shadow plays and he gave various examples of shadow play he gave home projects that you can do with food you know and also the splash time so those are some of the things you've learned from today's video so we have had fun experimenting with photography. Uh, you've learned how the history of cameras went about some of the activities you can do on the first video and how to take quality pictures. So now I have given you powers to go and uh, come up with activities that you can do to have fun taking pictures. And also you can go ahead and capture your images and send them on WhatsApp for us to see. So if you're on the road, take an image on the road, the cars are end of you, the people in the Matatu, eh, in your home, eh, your classmates, whoever you are with, take images and send us today. That's what I want you to do and have fun experimenting with photography. If there are no questions, I will end up this class here uh, and then I expect to see your images and the recording definitely will be uploaded on the LMS. Any question? And thank you for those that have come on sh such a short notice. But I also want to be fair for the class that was waiting for me because there was a clash on the timetable. But then I did not have the phone with WhatsApp, so I could not talk to you, Ari alone. But thank you for coming on board. At this hour, we've taken slightly more than one hour. So I'll let you go and enjoy your evening and so that you can be settled and have fun taking photographs and send them. I want to see, I want to see, I want to see your images. I want to see where you are, the people you are with, yeah, the cats, the dog, the cows, your environment. Take those images and send them. I'm waiting for them. Any question, Moredi, Karanja, Sandra, Wangeshi? No. 
Okay. I assume Karanja has spoken for everyone. Then all the best. See you on Wednesday. Same time. God bless you. Bye. Bye. I hope you had fun. <laughs> yes. You're welcome. <laughs>